I'm Dr. Paul Lichter, a professor of ophthalmology and visual sciences at the University of Michigan. My subspecialty is glaucoma, but I have done cataract surgery for decades, and today I'm going to talk to you about one aspect of cataract surgery, and that involves the selection of the intraocular lens. There are, of course, many techniques and subtleties to the cataract surgical procedure itself, and providing the patient with a consistent result without complications is essential. Without complications, we can put in the intended intraocular lens in the position that we intended to put it. Yet, however, I've noticed that in cataract surgery courses today, there's so much emphasis on the technique of the ways to perform the surgery that it's sometimes inadvertently the case that some important aspects surrounding the surgery can be taken for granted or omitted. And one of these can be the decision around the intraocular lens choice. So I'll go today to emphasize factors around this choice because once we've done the safe cataract operation, it's the intraocular lens choice that the patient lives with for their entire lifetime. The patient deserves our best advice on the intraocular lens that best meets their surgical goals. And meeting the patient's expectations doesn't necessarily need to mean that they spend a lot of money. So what are the patient's goals and their options? It's important to understand these to help us decide which intraocular lens to use for them. What's the motivating factor or factors for the patient to have cataract surgery in the first place? What's their vision? And what's their vision-related quality of life? The vision-related quality of life is far more important than the visual acuity on the eye chart, as you've heard others say in this course. But I like to use a scale of 1 to 100 and ask about vision-related quality of life, assuming that at age 30 it was 100%. So I'll ask the patient what it was five years ago. Maybe they would say 95%. What was it a year ago? Maybe they'd say 80%. And what was it six months ago? Maybe 70%. Meantime, you find out what it is today. And we use that in the discussion with the patient to decide on which lens is best for them. And we ask them a number of other questions, like what's their ability to drive, to read, to watch TV, and do other things that are important to them. Is our impression of the way the cataract appears at the slit lamp consistent with the patient's visual complaints? Is there macular disease that could be contributing to the patient's visual complaints, for example. Once you and the patient have made the decision to go ahead with cataract surgery, then what's the desired outcome? We want to know what the patient thinks. Is it to improve their vision-related quality of life, and that's it? Is it spectacle independence, or is it a cost-effective operation? Maybe it's all three, maybe more one or two of them. The patient is the only one who can tell us what is bothering them the most that's making them want to have cataract surgery in the first place. And determining that with the patient, and I don't have assistants do this, I do it myself, it helps the patient and me to be on the same page in terms of what's most important to the patient. I like to remember that my duty as the patient's physician is to place their interest first so in order for me to do that, I need to know what their interest is. How do you know if spectacle independence is important to the patient? Well, we need to ask how old the patient was when he or she started to wear glasses. Sometimes you'll get an answer of five years old and I've worn glasses every day of my life. On the other hand, some patients say, oh, just last year, doctor. Meantime, you want to know if the patient wears glasses all the time. Does the patient mind wearing glasses? Some people can't stand to wear glasses, and others are perfectly happy to wear them all the time. We want to know if the patient might be interested in trying to function some of the time, at least, without their glasses. Maybe all the time. Maybe they don't even care. I like to explain the optics of what's going on to the patient, and I use a chart or model so they can understand what we're doing, both with the operation and with the lens implant, how the lens helps to focus light on the retina, and how it affects reading and distance vision. If the patient indicates to me that they're used to wearing glasses, 
and all they care about is seeing better after the cataract operation, then why would I want to try to talk them into wanting to be spectacle-free as their most important goal? I've had patients who adamantly insist on wanting to wear their glasses after the surgery, even if they have no prescription in them effectively. If the patient says they're used to wearing glasses and they have an image of themselves wearing glasses, why should somebody decide what's best for the patient? They're the ones to decide what's best for them. And if glasses are the best for them, then that's what we should point for. We are obligated, however, to let the patient know of all of the interocular lens options so their choice of the lens they want is an informed one. For example, patients who don't mind wearing glasses, they might say, well, if I could function without glasses some of the time, that would be great. And that might influence the choice of what you decide to do with them. We are not, though, as surgeons, obligated to present the lens choices in a neutral way. We know much more than the patient. And without our help in evaluating those possible lens choices, the patient could be sold on a lens that's not necessarily best for them. So I think as surgeons, our duty is to help the patient make what is the best choice for them. Most cataract surgeons have a goal of making the patient not only satisfied, but knowing that we did our best for that patient. For some surgeons, it may include consideration of the financial return to their practice, and this is not an unreasonable consideration as long as it is not the overriding concern. The surgeon's goal is typically a safe, sure, and comfortable cataract intraocular lens procedure and a visual outcome that meets the patient's expectations. If we have to talk the patient into being happy, we've really failed in our preoperative discussion and the patient's ultimate intraocular lens choice. Talking the patient into being happy shouldn't be our goal. We can be using intraocular lenses that are a non-covered benefit under Medicare. And these can be called patient pay or out-of-pocket intraocular lenses. The reasoning behind the use of these lenses came from CMS, which considers any intraocular lens designed to correct a refractive error beyond the simple monofocal replacement of the eye's natural lens to be a refractive service. CMS does not cover refractive services and therefore allows surgeons to charge extra for these more expensive intraocular lenses. There are a number of these extra cost lenses, including toric and three multifocal types, as well as the crystal lens. The patient could well pay $2,500 out of pocket per eye for these lenses, sometimes even more. Multifocal lenses are known to reduce the quality of vision while providing in-focus vision at a range of distances. You can see in the center photograph the Technus intraocular lens that illustrates the various optical zones. And it's obvious that these optical zones have an effect on the quality of vision that passes through them. Yet, those rings in the lens enable the light to be focused at varying distances, and patients use what has been termed neuroadaptation to adjust to the change in their quality and focus of vision. It takes some time. Some patients don't get used to it. The crystal lens in your picture on the right is designed to accommodate, as we know, but most importantly, it's a monofocal lens. Many people advise a minus one diopter difference between the eyes, sort of a monovision approach, since the lens may not accommodate, in fact. There are some drivers to the surgeon's goal of financial return to their practice. A lot of this comes from the marketplace. We hear the term conversion rate to talk about patients who have come to the office, not wanting any particular lens, but they're converted to wanting a premium or patient pay lens. And some offices provide incentives to their staff to convert these patients 
to purchasing an out-of-pocket lens. This is part of the market-driven practice of medicine that we all see today. We see a lot of making your premium IOL patients happy courses and articles. Surgeons have learned a lot about keeping multifocal patients happy. And they've learned to not put these in in myopic patients because those patients can already read without their glasses. And now with the multifocal lens in their eye, they may actually have worse reading vision than they had prior to the cataract surgery, and this can make them very unhappy. Hyperopic patients, on the other hand, aren't so aware of the compromise in visual quality because many of these patients haven't had high quality vision without glasses for many years. And so multifocal lenses are much better tolerated in originally hyperopic patients. It's important that patients understand monovision and we need to explain it to them. It's actually a term that is a misnomer and many have tried to change it to the use of blended vision. Monovision, blended vision is a binocular vision. There's a misconception about this that the patient has one eye for distance and the other for near. That really isn't true. How could anyone want that when it's described that way to them? Many patients have had contact lens achieved monovision for many, many years and are very happy. And so this presbyopic correcting solution isn't anything new. Some surgeons believe that a contact lens trial is absolutely necessary to determine a patient's suitability for having monovision or blended vision. But it is not necessary and is not used by those surgeons who do a lot of monovision for their patients. Interestingly enough, contact lens trials are important to try monovision in phacic patients. But for some reason, in pseudophagic patients, monovision is invariably perfectly fine to them. A difference of minus one and a half diopters or so in the non-dominant eye is easily tolerated, and it results in good reading vision for most or all pseudophagic patients. Some surgeons should think about this. There is no possible contact lens trial to determine whether a patient is likely to tolerate the halos, the glare, and decreased contrast sensitivity that are common to all multifocal intraocular lenses. We put those in and see how the patient adapts to them. So a contact lens trial for monovision is um, far less necessary. It's too bad, though, that we don't have a trial to tell if patients would adapt to multifocal lenses, but there is no way to be sure. Toric lenses also need to be described to the patient and presented as an out-of-pocket option. The good news about toric lenses is they're monofocal, and so vision isn't compromised by them. But we should remember that patients who have just mild astigmatism, if we end up with a plano or slightly myopic spherical equivalent for them, patients will see very well and then won't have to have paid for a toric out-of-pocket charge. If the surgeon is considering financial return to the practice but not having unhappy patients with multifocal lenses, they can try crystal lens because these are monofocal lenses. It seems best to correct the non-dominant eye for near a bit because the crystal lens may not accommodate. And so because it's monofocal, there is no reduction in vision quality with these lenses, and there are no halos, there are no glare. Patients can use these lenses perfectly fine, and with a little bit of difference in the distance and near eye, the dominant and non-dominant eye, patients are even more pleased with them. So doing the best for our patients in terms of helping them choose the best intraocular lens for them, we want to always think about vision-related quality of life necessities. Again, we don't want to force an IOL on a patient that we're not sure is the best solution for them. We don't want to waste their money, and we don't want to leave them unhappy with their visual result for the rest of their lives. 
One of two studies that compared multifocal and monovision lenses is shown here. And the result was that monovision was at least as good as the vision from multifocal IOLs. Monovision is a covered Medicare benefit because it uses standard monofocal lenses. Now in this study, it was not randomized because of the cost of the multifocal lens to the patient. Nevertheless, the monovision patients came out quite well compared to the multifocal patients. Notice that none of the authors had a financial relationship to any industries involved with the intraocular lenses. Now, a second study that was done in England and published more recently randomized patients to monovision and multifocal intraocular lenses. Interestingly, the journal in which this article was published has a table of contents that has a precis. And under this title, it says patients undergoing bilateral cataract surgery are more likely to report being spectacle independent if they receive multifocal implants compared to monovision. But is that really true? Notice, by the way, in this article, the authors didn't report a relationship to industry either. However, the article was funded and the intraocular lenses were furnished by two manufacturers of those lenses. But is it true that monovision is not as good as multifocal vision for spectacle independence based on the results of this study? Let's see. Well, the study design would be predicted to achieve that result. So we need to understand the details of this study design rather than simply reading the precis. In this study, the near eye average monovision correction was only minus 0.923 diopters. And this kind of a near vision correction would never be expected to provide good reading vision, except with a tiny pupil in very bright light. So a result that favored multifocal IOLs for spectacle independence in this study isn't at all surprising based on the undercorrected near intraocular lens power. An important finding in this study is that nearly 6% of the patients in the multifocal arm underwent lens exchange compared to none of the monovision patients. This isn't a trivial difference since the risks of intraocular lens exchange are very important to the patient. There may well have been other patients who were not happy with their multifocal lenses but decided to put up with them rather than to go through the risks of a lens exchange. So again, we explain the intraocular lens options to our patient and the pros and cons of each, and then we use our own experience to help the patient decide which choice is best for them. We've seen tens and hundreds of these patients, even thousands, but the patient is only one. So we can't expect them to know which is best for them. We have to help them. We want to advise the patient in their best interest, not necessarily our best financial interest. After all, unhappy patients after a cataract operation will not only make the patient unhappy, it will make us unhappy. It will be a drain on ourselves and on our practice's resources. Toric lenses, as I've said, are fine in terms of the optics. But remember, most pseudophagic patients will see very well with small amounts of residual cylinder, and then they haven't had the need to pay out-of-pocket costs for the extra charge lens. Remember that an advantage of toric lenses as they are approved thus far in the United States is that they're monofocal, meaning no halos, glare, and decreased quality of vision. But pretty soon they're going to be multifocal toric lenses, and they will have the same side effects as multifocal lenses without a stigmatic correction. We also want to remember that other extra charge lenses, the multifocal lenses and the crystal lens, can cost our patients $2,500 per eye or more. We have to think about the cost-benefit ratio, and we need to think this out very well ourselves and with our patient. Many patients want the best, and they want the best for themselves and for their family, and they may think that paying a lot of money for an intraocular lens is the best choice.
but it may not be. Once a safe cataract operation is performed, as I said at the outset, the intraocular lens choice is what the patient lives with for the rest of their lives. So patients deserve our best advice on the intraocular lens that meets their needs. Meeting our patients' expectations doesn't necessarily mean having them spend a lot of money. So again, repeating, many surgeons find that monovision or blended vision with a minus one and a half diopter difference in the two eyes enables patients to have spectacle-free vision much of the time or all of the time and the patient has no risk of halos, glare, or reduction in vision quality that many of the multifocal patients experience. That isn't to say that multifocal lenses aren't the best choice for some patients. We need more science behind our advice that we give to patients. Visual issues with multifocal lenses are only reversible many times with a lens exchange if they're bad enough. Whereas wearing glasses alone will solve any problems with monovision. Remember again, monovision's a misnomer. Blended vision is binocular. It's not one eye for near and one eye for distance. The two eyes work together. Our brain puts them together and each eye helps the other for near and distance vision. One other thing I wanna leave with you is that in my practice, I never use a lens that leaves my patients hyperoptic, not even the slightest amount. If I aim for emetropia, I'll choose an intraocular lens that will leave the patient perhaps slightly myopic. If I miss my target slightly, then the patient might end up emetropic. And if I miss it even more on the minus side, the patient may be able to read with that eye without glasses. Those patients are invariably happy. But if I choose a lens exactly for emetropia and miss slightly on the hyperopic side, I will have a patient who is slightly hyperopic and that eye will not see anything sharply without spectacles. Those are patients who often become very unhappy after surgery. And my advice is that we should avoid this as much as we can to help both the patient and ourselves. Now, new intraocular lens solutions are under development. Some of them are very exciting. So today's best advice might change as we move along. It's certain to change, really. Perfect aberration-free and entirely spectacle-free vision after cataract surgery is a target that is elusive, and we cannot promise this to our patients. What we want to do, though, is help patients choose the best intraocular lens option for them to meet their visual expectations with our available technology. And when we do this well, our patients will be happy, and so will we. I hope that this segment has brought to mind the importance of the intraocular lens choice for our patients. Thank you for watching.